Tessa Devreza is an environmental designer and engineer. She serves as the program officer for the Clean Construction Program at C40 Cities, a network of mayors of nearly 100 world-leading cities collaborating to deliver the urgent action needed to confront the climate crisis. In her work, she supports cities in driving the transition to resource-efficient, resilient and zero-emission construction. Prior to joining C40, Tessa worked at Metabolic as well as XCO2. She holds degrees from the Bartlett School of Architecture at University College London and Cornell University. In this talk, I'll go over how cities are approaching the impacts of construction and what everyone can learn from their approach. The construction sector in its current form contributes significantly to the climate and biodiversity crises, and it's lagged behind other industries in decarbonizing. It emits over 23% of global GHG emissions and consumes 30 to 50% of globally extracted resources. The Clean Construction Program at C40 was established in 2019 to address these challenges. Our program works with over 35 cities around the world to support the city's transition to a resilient and decarbonized urban fabric. This will help deliver a city that is healthier for its residents, that's resource efficient, just, and inclusive. We do this by facilitating city to city act uh, sharing, supporting capacity building initiatives within the city, as well as fostering discussions with industry players and supporting city business collaboration. The content we cover in the program is centered around four key pillars, and this broad scope is by design. These pillars ensure all action on decarbonization in the built environment are holistic and support a complete vision for sustainable cities. The first pillar is perhaps the most obvious. It's the mitigation of embodied carbon and ecosystem impacts caused by construction. This includes measures, policies, and standards that help reduce whole life carbon emissions from a construction project by, for example, material switching to bio-based materials such as timber. This also includes initiatives that help drive circularity of building materials and improve resource efficiency. The second pillar centers on climate resilience and future adaptation. This means ensuring buildings and infrastructure are built for the climate risks of the future, as well as the evolving needs of the city to avoid early obsolescence. The third pillar centers on the health and social impacts of construction. We know the way we plan our cities directly impacts uh, social outcomes, and we want to design spaces that are inclusive and just. This pillar also includes issues like indoor air quality or the impact of local air pollution due to construction sites. The fourth pillar that we focus on in our program is the economic role of the sector. About 10% of the working population of the world is involved in the construction industry. This pillar ensures that the transition uh, to new ways of working is just and inclusive and speaks directly to the workers on the ground who will deliver these changes. Cities all have very different contexts, politically, environmentally, and socially. So there's no overarching policy recipe for industry transformation that can be applied in every context. Timber construction is a great solution, but it's not the answer everywhere. So how do we know where to start? We've established a set of principles that we call the clean construction hierarchy to organize our thinking around action and policy options. The clean construction hierarchy can help contextualize building strategies like the use of timber or other bio-based materials to make sure they align with the bigger picture, uh, be it on the city scale or on the project scale. The first step of the construction hierarchy is to prioritize existing assets. This means optimizing the use of existing buildings and infrastructure and repurposing and retrofitting them where necessary. Most people who work in the building space know that the most sustainable building is the one that's never built. Many cities have empty, underused or stranded assets around the city that can be used for a new purpose, sometimes even negating the need for a brand new building. This principle is even more important to apply due to the extreme use changes in the city due to the COVID-19 pandemic. A few cities have great initiatives tracking and reintroducing underutilized buildings into the building stock. One example of this is Milan's degraded and abandoned buildings map, which tracks vacant and derelict space in the city as part of a program to renovate and bring them back into use. There's an interactive map online that illustrates where these spaces are located as well. Another is the Vancouver Empty Homes Tax, which helps return empty and underused properties to the market. The tax has reduced vacant property in the city by 25% since 2017, and, revenues that the, that, and the revenues that the city has earned have been used to support affordable housing initiatives. 
So once we've ensured all existing assets are being used, we can turn to the materials and new projects. The second step of the construction hierarchy centers around material choices, using materials efficiently and switching to low carbon materials. Switching out concrete and steel elements for their lower carbon co counterparts or for bio-based materials like timber um, can often feel like the first obvious step, but it's important to remember the order of operations. Reusing existing materials or building components should be considered before using new materials, even bio-based ones. There are many policy avenues in cities that are taking, um, there are many policies that cities are taking to influence the material choices of new projects in their city. We'll focus on the two that have garnered the most traction, city procurement policies and planning policies. Procurement policies are a great way to introduce the industry to city priorities, and depending on the size of municipal projects, it can measurably shift the market as well. A great example of this is California's Buy Clean Act, which was adopted by the city of Los Angeles. It regulates the global warming potential of steel, flat glass, and mineral wool procured by the municipality for public projects. Planning policies are another key mechanism. London's centralized planning document, the New London Plan, includes requirements for all schemes referable to the mayor. So these are projects that meet a certain size threshold or are built in a specific area. Um, it requires them to provide whole life carbon assessments and circular economy statements. Cities choose the policies best suited to their situation, balancing the powers available to the city, the landscape of the local construction industry, and the construction needs of the city. The third step of the construction hierarchy is to plan, design, and build for the future. Embedding climate resilience in design and material choices can avoid exposure to climate risks like extreme heat and flooding. Designing for disassembly can ease the transition to a circular economy in the future. A key component of the stage is building in future flexibility. This includes establishing the infrastructure needed for local, circular, low-carbon material economies. One example of this is Paris's reversible building target. Reversible here means built in an adaptable and deconstructible way. They're aiming for 30% of new office buildings to be built reversibly by 2030 and 50% by 2050. On the other side of the spectrum, uh, cities like Portland have found success with their deconstruction ordinances, requiring that homes built before the 1940s are deconstructed and not demolished. This, is, this has in turn allowed for a secondhand material market to flourish. Lastly, in the hierarchy, we look at ensuring sites are clean and safe. A big part of this is reducing the significant local air and noise pollution that comes from a construction site in the city center. This means switching to electric construction machinery where available and optimizing trips to and from the construction site. It's important to remember that the choice of materials and construction methods have a significant um, impact on these outcomes on the ground as well. Prefabricated methods of construction, um, like those used with mass timber, can be constructed much faster than traditional methods of construction. This cuts down on the emissions as well as the air and noise pollution from the site. So that was the clean construction hierarchy. Again, we use this approach because cities are politically, socially, and environmentally diverse, and the policies they apply to create a more resilient and carbon neutral built environment will vary accordingly. They are, however, aligned in vision and purpose. We're happy to be seeing more and more cities take a public stance on the issue. Five visionary city cities have signed up to the C40 Clean Construction Declaration. In doing so, they've pledged to collaborate with their industry and to take action to have embodied emissions from the built environment. In addition to this, 110 cities have taken the Clean Construction Pledge as part of the city's race to zero, really illustrating the momentum that's building here. We hope that wherever you have the option to take action in this area, that you'll do so as well. Thank you.